Hello, my name is George Aranda, and today I present to you a documentary covering the infamous serial killer, Ted Bundy. In this presentation, I will go over the psychology of Ted Bundy and how his childhood, education, work experience, and relationships all played a role on influencing Ted to kill many young women. Many believe it was Ted's childhood that sparked his bloody rampage. Ted Bundy was actually born Theodore Cowell on November 24, 1946. Due to his illegitimate birth, his biological mother, Eleanor Cowell, moved in with her parents where he was told his grandparents were his parents and that his mother was his sister. To make matters worse, his grandmother suffered from clinical depression as well as panic attacks. It is also speculated that his grandfather, Samuel Cowell, was an extremely violent and frightening man. The confusion on who his mother was began to take a toll on Ted at an early age. When he was just three years old, Ted collected all the knives in the house and surrounded his napping aunt with them. His mother, concerned with Ted's well-being, decided to move to Tacoma, Washington. This also negatively impacted Ted as he was forced to leave who he believed was his father and mother. In Tacoma, Eleanor met a man who she would go on to marry. His name was John Bundy. It was then Ted would get his name that he would carry with him the rest of his life, Ted Robert Bundy. Despite the name Despite the new name and the addition of four half-siblings, Ted wanted nothing to do with his stepfamily and instead looked up to his great-uncle, Jack Cowell. Despite Ted being good-looking and smart, he was said to be very awkward and timid. This shy behavior was extremely noticeable with the girls as he never associated with them. The only time he did was when he was asked to a Sadie's Hawkins dance. At the age of 15, he also started to perceive himself as above the law. He was an expert shot with her and was suspected for two burg burglary crimes. This self-superior attitude can be diagnosed as a psychological personality disorder, grandiose narcissism. He graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School in 1965 with the B average. Ted attended the University of Washington, majoring in Chinese culture. It was in college where Ted began to deceive his self-perception. Ted did not want to be shy and awkward anymore leading him to act as a sophisticated, normal college student. His new personality mask helped Ted meet his first girlfriend, Stephanie Brooks. This was Ted's first intimate relationship, which ended in about a year. The breakup devastated Ted and caused him to drop out of college. He then went home to answer the question burning inside him. Who was he? After much investigation, he eventually found out his mother, who he believed was his sister the whole time, birthed him illegitimately. It was the second time in a short period he was crushed by a woman, and Ted was extremely devastated by the fact he was betrayed by his own mother. It is believed that it was at this time in Ted's life that he decided to gain re revenge on the woman who had destroyed his life. Ted later returned to the University of Washington to study psychology. He excelled in his class and appeared rejuvenated despite what had recently occurred to him. Ted began to practice hiding those dark thoughts inside him and de deceive others as a hard-working, content young man. Others actually thought the discovery of the lie changed his life for the better. After graduating from college, Ted fluctuated from job to job. He was a grocery clerk, a legal aid, etc. However, there was one occupation he stuck with consistently, a suicide hotline volunteer. Ironically, Ted saved many lives working for the suicide line and was said to be a normal, good guy. Ted's first girlfriend was Stephanie Brooks. In my opinion, this relationship is what really set off Ted Bundy because it was his first time being in an intimate, sexual relationship. It's easy to understand why he was so devastated when Stephanie ended things. It was his first time loving someone that was honest to him. You can also draw the comparison that most women he murdered were all very similar to Stephanie Brooks, young, pretty, Caucasian woman with shoulder-length hair. It was always the hair that attracted Ted to these women the most. Ted also met a friend when he was volunteering at the suicide hotline, Ann Rule. Ann Rule was also a victim of Ted's master manipulation and doubted his guiltiness until she recognized a police sketch that resembled the looks of Ted Bundy, forcing her to tip the authorities of his whereabouts. Ted only confessed to killing 30 women the day of his execution. However, a former defense attorney claims Ted told him he killed 100 people, and not just women. He was known for being extremely charismatic, which allowed him to gain the trust of his victims before he murdered them. 
His good looks also aided Ted in manipulating the poor woman he raped, then murdered. Most kills were with a knife or beaten to death. There were many other events that made Ted Bundy such an infamous serial killer, which even led to a movie based on his stories. Bundy actually escaped police custody twice. The first time was when he was left unattended in a library where he jumped out the two-story building. The next, he escaped from his prison ceiling, exiting from a hole he had been creating for several weeks. He then stole a guard's uniform and walked out the prison casually. Both escapes allowed Ted to add on to his deadly body count. Ted also helped the much-respected detective who actually caught Ted in the Green River case. He helped Robert D. Keppel by explaining to him how the mind of a serial killer works, thus allowing Keppel to catch the Green River killer. The following clip is Ted Bundy's last interview before his execution. dedicated and loving parents and one of uh, five brothers and sisters. A uh, home where we as, our, as children were the focus of, of my parents' lives, where we regularly attended church with two Christian parents who did not drink, they did not smoke, there was no gambling, there was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. That basically, I was a normal person. I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum. Uh, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with them, and just tell. I mean, I, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And it happens, it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which, which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of uh, excitement, until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Those of us who are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular, pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home. It snatched me out of my home 20, 30, 
30 years ago. And, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good of a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, there is no protection against the kind that the kinds of influences that are loose in the society that, that, that tolerates 